Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters. So Ramadan's coming up in a few days, and I thought, what better way to kick things off than to go through some of David Wood's most classical garbage. Today we're going to hear him rationalize how God can die. I hope you're all ready for this. Hi, this is David Wood with Act 17. Over the past couple of months we've received several requests from our Muslim friends to answer the question, how can God die? We heard this objection at the festival from our friend Hakim and from others. Then just last week, a young Muslim named Ali sent us a YouTube request with the same question. Stated in its full force, the objection would go something like this. Christians believe that Jesus is God. Yes. And Christians believe that Jesus died. Yes. So Christians believe that God died. Exactly. But God is eternal and unchanging and all-powerful. What sense does it make to say that he died? Yes. He finally did it! Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah Oh wait, there's still 10 minutes left. I'm gonna try to justify this, aren't you? If you're not clear on what Christians believe, this is a perfectly reasonable question to ask. This is a reasonable question whether you're clear or not, because it's an unreasonable position to hold. Ask in fact, Nabil and I get excited when Muslims ask questions like this because it gives us an opportunity to clarify the gospel, and clarification is crucial because very few Muslims understand the gospel. Very few Christians understand the gospel. To add insult to injury, very few Christians understand the Quran. Everything they know about the Quran usually comes from lying missionaries like you. In this video, I'm going to do three things. First, I'm going to state the Christian view so that everyone knows what we're claiming. Second, I'm going to try to help Muslims understand our view by drawing attention to certain Muslim beliefs. Of course you're going to do that, David. You don't know how not to play the appeal to hypocrisy game when dealing with Islam. And finally, I'm going to show why the Christian view has to be correct, and why the Muslim view has to be false. Alright, go for it. I haven't had a good laugh since Rise of the Skywalker. This should be fun. In the first verse of the book of John, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word was in the beginning, before anything was created. Verse 3 says that everything was created through the Word. The Word was with God, indicating that there's a distinction in the Godhead, later to be fully clarified as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Where? And the Word was God, indicating that the Word was, by nature, in essence, God. Verse 14 goes on to say that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is referring, of course, to Jesus. I'm not going to get into why everything about this understanding is wrong. This video will be too long. Some other time, inshallah. So Christians aren't saying that God, as he is in himself, eternal and incorruptible, died one day. The Christian claim is that the second person of the Trinity, who is God, entered into creation, taking on human flesh, so that he could be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. So you guys believe that God is a single being, but part of that being became a different being without ceasing to be the previous being. Yeah, that makes sense. David, you do realize that if the word became something other than what it was initially, then it no longer is that thing that it was initially. In other words, Jesus stopped being God and became a human being. So it is wrong to say that God died. The reason why Christians won't admit this is because if God is not material, i.e. he isn't made of anything in the created realm, then if a created part of him is hurt, the God part isn't hurt. If a created part of him dies, the God part doesn't die. Claiming that both the natures coexist doesn't solve this problem. You'd just be slapping one false statement on top of another to help us not think about how ridiculous the first false statement sounds. To put it into perspective, suppose God himself were to show you an apple. He gives you every reason why it's an apple by defining its qualities, like the shape, varying colors, taste, places it grows, and so on. Immediately, he transforms that apple into a baseball and still tells you this is an apple. In this chain of events, there are obvious problems here. We can't accept all of this information as a mystery because everything that we know was defined right in our faces. And then the script was flipped by God himself. Either the first premise is wrong and God lied about what makes an apple an apple. The second premise is a lie because he's lying when he says that the baseball is an apple, or God went behind our backs and redefined what makes an apple an apple, which would still make the first premise a waste of time, and deceitful. Now let's compare this to Jesus. 
Christians will insist that he became a being that can die after being immortal. If we accept that God is immortal, then we have to reject that God is mortal because we have already defined immortality as everlasting, unable to die. Thus, we have to reject that he actually can die, especially if we accept the Trinity explanation of God, which is that all of the attributes of the being of God are shared between all the persons. If so, then he should be immortal by virtue of being in the Godhead. Yet, you will have me believe that he became a being that broke off from that. This would mean that Jesus became his own being, giving us two gods, one of which is clearly not worthy of worship since he can't do anything that God can do. So how can a Muslim maintain that our view is somehow incoherent? Because it literally is. Here, our Muslim friends, I'm not your friend, might say that God can't enter into his creation, but as a Muslim, you shouldn't say this. In fact, if you say that God can't enter into his creation, you're contradicting the Quran. Oh. In Surah 27, 7 through 9, we read, Call to mind when Moses said to his family, I perceive a fire. I will bring you from there some news of great import, or I will bring you a flaming brand that you may warm yourselves. So when he came to it, he was called by a voice. Blessed is he who is in the fire, and also those around it. And glorified be Allah, the Lord of the worlds. O Moses, verily I am Allah, the mighty, the wise. Okay, I fail to see the problem here. So the voice says, blessed is he who is in the fire. And Allah speaks out of the fire. No, he just speaks to Moses. He doesn't have to be the fire or be in the fire to speak to him. Who's the blessed one in the fire? Moses. Allah. If Allah can enter into his creation and speak out of a fire, can't he enter into his creation and speak out of human flesh? I don't know about you guys, but I'm really getting sick of Christians using vague examples like this to justify the idea that God entered into creation from the Quran. They have to find some twisted way to interpret it and make it sound like something is happening, even though it's never actually stated to have happened. This verse doesn't say that God became the fire or that he entered into the fire. You are reading that into it. This isn't how we do exegesis. This is how you people do it. Keep this mindset away from our book. There are two main things I want to use to destroy this argument. Firstly, even if this verse does show that Allah entered into creation, it doesn't prove that he could become something within the creation. Even David said, Who's the blessed one in the fire? Allah. He did not say that Allah was the fire, simply a being that spoke from within it. So even by David's logic, he could still be just as powerful once he entered into the fire. Our problem isn't God entering into the creation, our problem is God becoming it. So if I really, really try to give the advantage to David Wood on this verse, it still wouldn't prove his point. Furthermore, for all you Christians who love to find new and innovative ways to prove that this is possible through the Quran, I have a treat for you. It's in Surah Al-Araf, chapter 7, verse 143. And when Musa arrived at our appointed time and his Lord spoke to him, he said, My Lord, show me yourself that I may look at you. Allah said, You will not see me, but look at the mountain. If it should remain in place, then you will see me. But when his Lord appeared to the mountain, he rendered it level, and Moses fell unconscious. And when he awoke, he said, Exalted are you, I have repented to you, and I am the first of the believers. And as Saudi reported that Ikrama reported from Ibn Abbas about Allah saying, And when his Lord appeared to the mountain, only the extent of the finger appeared to him. In other words, they're trying to give the smallest measurement of Allah's nur that appeared to them before the mountain collapsed. Unlike the stuff you like to throw our way, which could mean several different things, this is explicitly clear. The smallest measurable amount of Allah's light was shown to a mountain, only for it to shatter to dust. The Quran gives an answer to this conversation, and the answer is no. Allah does not enter his creation. He can't without turning down his power level or making the creation strong enough to handle his mighty presence. Neither things have ever happened. <laughs>
The correct Muslim answer is, yes, of course, God can do that. He's all-powerful. Don't tell me what the correct Muslim response is. Becoming weak and dependent isn't a sign of your power. It's a sign of your lack thereof. Could you imagine someone trying to join the Avengers when their only ability is to turn their skin purple? What good would that do? Despite such an ability being completely useless, you would hail it as magnificent just because it's possible. Just as you think God dying is amazing just because you believe it to be possible. Even though becoming weak and dying isn't exactly an amazing power. Bragging about God becoming weak would only be good for you if becoming weak is better than staying strong. But it isn't. I can't believe I even have to say this. If anything, it shows that my God could crush yours. Christians and Muslims then have to agree that God can enter into his creation. No, we don't. But perhaps a Muslim will say here, okay, God can enter into his creation, but if he does, how can he die? Good question. In response, let me illustrate by pointing out what Muslims believe about the Quran. This is a Quran. This Quran, according to Islam, has two natures. What? On the one hand, as the eternal word of Allah, it has no beginning, it was not created, it cannot be destroyed. On the other hand, this Quran is made of paper and ink and glue. These are physical materials. Your point? Now, on September 11th, a church in Florida is apparently hosting Burn the Quran Day. Ali, one of the young Muslims who asked us to explain how God can die, also asked what we think about Burn the Quran Day. For the record, Ali, I think it's ridiculous and idiotic, and I can guarantee that Nabil feels the same way. You can quote me on that. Is it as ridiculous as making propaganda mockery videos on the Prophet Muhammad meeting a bunch of different people? Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Muhammad's Boom Boom Room, where all of my guests either agree with me completely or they go boom. I am your host, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon me. Yeah, this is the kind of stuff he does. Or making an ugly picture of him and putting him in a thumbnail saying something stupid. You're not too far off from these people, David. In fact, what you do is a greater offense. Who cares if people burn Qurans? I sure don't. I got like a billion of these things in one country alone. Millions of textual and audio recordings online. Millions of people who have memorized the entire book word for word and can recite it without looking while also knowing Arabic well enough to rewrite it and a chain of memorizers including more than 11 million people going all the way back to the Prophet himself. You burning the Quran hurts me in no way whatsoever. You're just wasting time and resources to show a pathetic display of rebellion to something that isn't affecting you in any way, like the bra-burning feminists of the rabbit hole of Tumblr. You, on the other hand, make videos that are made to mock and insult Muslims, their beliefs, and the man they hold the most dear and help reinforce the garbage lies that you fed your audience over the years. Your actions are hindering Islam through lies and desensitization and promoting bad blood. It reminds me of Jewish hate propaganda in Nazi Germany and African-American hate propaganda in the early 1900s. You and the Quran burners are cut from the same cloth. Your intentions are the same, your methods are worse. But it does raise an interesting question for purposes of this discussion. Muslims ask, how can God die, as if this somehow refutes the Christian view? But let me ask, how can the eternal word of Allah be burned? The Mus'haf is not the eternal word of Allah. It was written and produced by man. It is literally man-made. The correct Muslim response here is this. David, as Muslims, we're not saying that when someone burns the Quran, Allah's eternal word is destroyed. No, when someone burns the Quran, the paper and ink and glue that make up the physical nature of that Quran are destroyed. But the eternal nature of the Quran remains unchanged. What physical nature? The Quran was revealed orally, and people wrote it down. It's not like an ice cube having both a hard nature and a cold nature that make up what it is. The Quran was written as it was heard. This is like drawing an image of an ice cube and then claiming that the image is part of the drawn nature. Ugh. Interesting. Let me see if I understand. You don't, but keep going. The eternal word of Allah, which is uncreated and indestructible, enters our world as a physical Quran, which is created and can be destroyed. Yow. If this Quran is destroyed, Muslims won't say that Allah's eternal word is destroyed. They'll simply say that the Quran has two natures, an eternal nature and a physical nature, and that it's the physical nature that can be destroyed by burning. No, we Muslims do not believe that in the beginning was the Quran, and the Quran was with Allah, and the Quran was Allah, and the Quran became a book and dwelt among us. The Quran did not become a book. If you insist that it did, then you must answer the question. If the Quran became a book, 
Which one is it? Is it the Tokapi manuscript? Or was it the Abu Bakr manuscript? Or the Uthmani manuscript? When did it become a book? At the beginning of Revelation? No, because that was the beginning of Revelation, and there was barely any Quran revealed at that time. Was it at the end? No, there's no evidence of this anywhere, and we know that it hadn't been codified as a complete version until after the death of the Prophet. By the very nature of this argument, if the eternal word of Allah became a book, then the eternal word of Allah would no longer exist since it became a book, something that's not eternal. Also, why would we get upset if someone burned the Quran, when the eternal word of Allah could not possibly inhabit every single copy of the Quran in the world? Burning one would just mean you burnt a copy of the eternal word. But where is it? Muslims don't believe that the eternal word occupies a single book. For people who constantly accuse the Quran of not being authentically preserved, I have no idea why you would make such an argument. Because this argument demands that you now have to prove that it's been preserved. You now have to prove that God became a book, something we've never claimed. And if you could prove that, you would prove that the Quran definitely is from God. Because how else would you explain something like that? It's amazing how he doesn't see how this exposes his doctrine, by the way. You see, he wants us to think that Jesus could die without the almighty, full power God dying. Just like the Quran. The difference is that the Quran isn't Allah, so that's kind of dumb on him. But also, because he makes a distinction between the eternal nature and the book nature. And says that one can be destroyed without harming the other. In other words, Jesus' human nature is not God, and is expendable. God is eternal and unchanging and all-powerful. What sense does it make to say that he died? Jesus is merely an avatar of the God part. Because similarly, if every single Mus'haf and Hafiz of Quran were to all die at once, leaving behind no trace, the eternal word of Allah would not be harmed or changed. David is also making a clear distinction between the two natures as different beings. One right down here on earth, which can be destroyed, and another up in heaven, which cannot be destroyed, which gives us two gods, one worthy of worship, the other not. This is like writing love on a sheet of paper and then burning it, then claiming that you killed love. No, the piece of paper didn't hold any value to the concept of love whatsoever. Burning it means nothing. So just like how burning a sheet of paper doesn't hurt the eternal word of Allah, which is the divine part, so too, killing the human part of Jesus wouldn't hurt the God part of Jesus. They're different parts. And so the human part is not the God part. The human part is not God. The human part is not worthy of worship. God didn't die on the cross. Jesus became his own being, which gives you more than one God. One who is not worthy of worship. If you stand by this, you've committed a heresy called docetism, which is the belief that Jesus was God, but he only appeared to be human puppeteering a human body. This is exactly the problem with Christians and their insistence on giving dawah of the Trinity. You're always gonna run either into a fallacy or a heresy. In your desperate attempt to show that the Quran is the same as the incarnation theory, you end up showing how it actually doesn't make sense and leads to a heresy. And you only got to this point because of a fallacy. This is why the only way to defend this doctrine is to say that it's a holy mystery which helps no one, and it only shows that this doctrine can only be followed blindly. Question, David. If I burn a picture of Jesus drawn on it, did I kill Jesus? Think about that. But how is this so very different from the Christian claim that the Divine Son, the eternal Word of God, became flesh and dwelt among us, that he entered into his creation as Jesus of Nazareth, and that once he had taken on human flesh, his physical nature, since it was created and perishable, was capable of dying, even though his divine nature could not die. Put simply, it means that God didn't die. If the only part of him that died was the created part, then the divine nature wasn't damaged at all. Then God was fine, then God didn't die for your sins, and you're making a distinction between beings, giving us two Jesuses, one that can die and one that can't. My Muslim friends, we're not friends. If you say it's a problem for God to take on a physical form, which can be killed, why wouldn't you say that it's also a problem for the eternal word of Allah to take on a physical form which can be burned? <laughs> because it didn't happen. This seems like an inconsistency to me. Please clarify your position, if you can. You don't need to clarify anything, because we never held this position in the first place. You invented this. Until I get a good response here, I can only conclude that Christians and Muslims have to agree that God has the power to enter his creation as a human being, and that if he does, his human body will be capable of dying. We don't have to agree on anything, Mr. Wood. But if we have to agree on this point, why are Muslims so confused by the Christian claim 
that Jesus is God and that Jesus died on the cross. I don't know, David. You tell me so that I may be blown away once again. The real confusion on this issue comes from Islamic theology. You see, in Islam, it makes no sense for Allah to enter his creation to die for sins because... Because it's not necessary? Because Allah's justice, love, and mercy are all limited and imperfect. What does this have to do with anything? For instance, what does the Quran say about Allah's love? Allah does not love those who exceed the limits. Allah does not love any ungrateful sinner. Allah does not love the unbelievers. Allah does not love the unjust. Allah does not love him who is proud, boastful. Allah does not love the extravagant. Allah does not love the treacherous. Allah does not love the mischief makers. Allah does not love any arrogant boaster. Hmm. I didn't quite catch the problem. The God of Islam only seems to love good Muslims. Allah has no love for rebellious sinners or unbelievers. So would a God who doesn't love sinners enter into the world to die for sinners? Of course not. The God of the Quran wouldn't do that because he just doesn't care about people that much. <laughs> oh, wow. This is something else, David. Why should God show love for people who don't deserve it? Assuming he must die to save them, why must he die for people who don't deserve it? Why am I even bothering with this point? It's completely idiotic. Listen, Mr. Wood, if Allah didn't care about people that much, he wouldn't give them a metric ton of prophets and revelations from those prophets so that they may be guided. Love and acceptance are for those who accept it. Now, look at how easily all of this could be thrown right back at him. Allah does not love those who exceed the limits. The God of the Bible does not love those who exceed the limits. Allah does not love any ungrateful sinner. The God of the Bible does not love ungrateful sinners. Allah does not love the unbelievers. The God of the Bible does not love disbelievers. Allah does not love the unjust. The God of the Bible does not love the unjust. Allah does not love him who is proud, boastful. The God of the Bible does not love the arrogant. Allah does not love the extravagant. The God of the Bible does not love the extravagant. Allah does not love the treacherous. The God of the Bible does not love the treacherous. Allah does not love the mischief makers. The God of the Bible does not love the mischief makers. Allah does not love any arrogant boaster. The God of the Bible does not love any arrogant boaster. The God of Islam only seems to love good Muslims. Allah has no love for rebellious sinners or unbelievers. The God of the Bible only seems to love good Jews and Christians. He has no love for rebellious sinners and unbelievers. So would a God who doesn't love sinners enter into the world to die for sinners? So would a God who doesn't love unbelievers enter into creation to die for them? Of course not. The God of the Quran wouldn't do that because he just doesn't care about people that much. Of course not. The God of the Bible wouldn't do that because he just doesn't care about people that much. Ah, that was fun. You guys love to preach about unconditional love, but at some point you have to stop and take an honest look at this concept and ask yourselves what it means. What's it worth? Unconditional love is meaningless, pointless, and hollow. If someone loves you for no reason, then what am I supposed to take away from that? That this person is super loving? Why? What kind of emotional takeaway am I supposed to take away from someone who loves me for no reason? Why would God love people who don't deserve to be loved? Who are probably far too psychotic and sick in the head to even know what love is. I walked into my dad's bedroom at about 2 o'clock in the morning, Thanksgiving Day. I stood over him with a hammer and I tried to think of one wrong thing he'd ever done to me. Nothing came to mind. So I drew back my arm and came down on him with all 230 pounds. I didn't know how fast blood could come out of someone's head kept hitting him until I was sure he was dead. This is like a mentally deranged obsession with an abusive boyfriend. But for you, it's the gospel. To add to that, Jesus said in John 14, 21, that you will be loved by him and his father if you accept him. In other words, his love is conditional. And if his love is conditional, he does not love everyone. I should also point out that Allah's justice is limited and flawed. According to Islam, if Allah wants to forgive you, he can just sweep your sins under the rug, pretend they never happened. Yeah, but you're leaving out important details, such as the obvious fact that these people would have to have done something in the life before to earn forgiveness. He doesn't just randomly decide to forgive people for no reason. It's only just if they did something to earn it. That may be merciful, but it's not just. Islam teaches that at the end of time, there will be unpunished sin. That means that Allah's justice isn't perfect. He's going to let some sin slide. What is justice, Mr. Wood? 
Fairness. Allah will give everyone what they deserve, and if they deserve forgiveness, He will forgive them. Justice doesn't have to be punishment. Now, how does this compare with the one true God? Well, the God of the Bible is perfect in His attributes. God's love and mercy are perfect. God loves sinners so much that He became one and committed suicide? That He entered into creation in order to pay the price for our sins. Which part of the Tanakh, you know, the Old Testament, are you going to quote to support that? Romans 5, 6-8 says that- Oh right, Paul. Good old Paul. You know, Paul wrote about how God hated Esau. You know, the brother of Jacob. Just saying. While we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Notice also that at the end of time, all sin is punished in Christianity. Either you pay for your own sin, or you're forgiven, in which case Jesus himself takes the penalty. Then what was the point of him entering into creation to die for us if he was just going to do it all over again at the end of days? Why not just do it right then and there? You know, he could just pop up and say, I'm going to die for you guys' sins, so you don't got to worry about keeping the law anymore, and then go right back up to his heavenly father. You're now adding more holes in this idea than there already were. Since the God of the Bible punishes all sins, his justice is perfect. No, it's not. Justice is when fairness is dealt, not when the punishment is dished out even to someone who did nothing to earn it. If someone murdered a man, but he believed in Jesus, Jesus would be tortured so that that man wouldn't be tortured? If so, then God isn't forgiving anybody. He's just transferring the punishment onto someone else, which is just worse, since that person didn't do anything worthy of blame, and the person being forgiven didn't do anything worthy of forgiveness. He just believed in someone and got off scot-free. Could you imagine living in a world where nothing you did made God happy or willing to forgive you? How is that just? You create people knowing that they're gonna sin, and you condemn them to an infinite punishment for the littlest thing? Why make an imperfect creation and not change the rules a little bit? Or add some? Give them a way out. You're God. You can do anything. Yet you choose to become a man to die for sinners? Why? In Islam, forgiveness is earned. And once Allah forgives you, the sin is forgotten. You, on the other hand, want me to believe that God doesn't forgive anybody. He just spins the wheel to decide who's going to take on his wrath. Justice doesn't mean punishment in Islam. It just means fairness. And that can entail a lot of things. Like giving someone money that they rightfully earn after doing a successful job for you. If, for example, you said a bad word what the f in Islam, if you sincerely repent, then you're forgiven. And it could be as simple as uttering the words, Astaghfirullah. And that's it. Done. It's justice because you did something to get in trouble, and so you did something else to get out of trouble. You get what you deserve. Justice doesn't have to be something to be afraid of. Otherwise, we wouldn't have it in our governments. In regards to punishment, justice is not when a punishment is dealt. Justice is when the person who deserved to be punished is punished. If a baby gets punished for the sins of a tyrant, how is that just? By your logic, it's just simply because someone was punished, even though it was clearly the wrong person. In any system of justice, punishment is only just if the person who needs to be punished is punished. Just because the punishment is transferred doesn't make it fair. You think it's fair just because the punishment happened. That's just nonsense. Now, I know that this is difficult for Muslims to grasp. They can't comprehend a God who would love people so much that he would lay aside his glory, enter into his creation, and pay the price for our sins. But let me ask you this, my Muslim friends. We're not friends. Suppose you were king of the world, dressed in royal robes. One day your servants are carrying you around when you look over and see that your child is drowning in a pool of mud. Why would he be drowning in mud of all things? Why not water or quicksand? Wouldn't you throw your robes aside and dive right into that mud to save the child you love? No, David, I will let him drown for the sins of the world. Carry on. Would it matter to you that you're king of the world? No. Well, yeah, because if I'm king of the world, or a god, since that's who you're trying to tie this analogy to, then I would just use my super awesome god powers and teleport him out of the mud. Oh no, it only counts if I throw aside my super awesome god powers to go and save him, right? Okay, right, we're operating by David's logic. If that's so, then why not become a kid? You know, get down on his level, lower yourself. If you're an adult male, it'll be so easy to save him, wouldn't it? Become a kid, drown with him. All that would matter is your child. Wait, hang on a second. 
Why would I say them? There are two possibilities in this analogy of yours. Either I'm God and I have to die for the sins of the world, or the son who's drowning is Jesus and I have to go and save him. If I accept the former, then I'm not going to save anybody. I'm just going to go down there and drown along with him. If I accept the latter, then I'm not going to save him because he has to drown for the sins of the world. So, if anything, this shows how your doctrine is wrong. If that's how great your love is, how much greater do you think God's love is? Enough to enter creation and die for us? That's the God I'm proclaiming to you. I know that God's wisdom entails that it simply isn't necessary for him to do anything like that. He's not irrational, so he would have already known that such a thing was going to happen ahead of time. And he wouldn't do something crazy, like limit himself, because yeah, that's necessary. And if he chose to save people, he would just do it. He doesn't have to become them to save them. Why do you think this? Muslims bring up these objections to show Christians that there's something wrong with our view of God. But as soon as we dig a little deeper, we find that the Muslim view insults and degrades God by limiting his attributes, while the Christian view honors God by displaying his perfection. You literally spent the entire video talking about how God limited himself into a being that could die. Now you're accusing us of degrading God by taking away the idea that something could destroy him? Make up your mind. One definition of God is this. God is the greatest possible being, the greatest conceivable being. So if I can think of a being greater than your God, you're not really worshiping God. Anything you conceive would be your conception. Humans can't just sit back and imagine their view of the best God ever. Left to their own devices, the devil would just come along and give them wacky ideas like Hinduism. Your conception of God would just end up being a philosophical battle against someone else's with no solid foundation. To that I say, Laysa kemitli hi shay. But if I were to accept this idea, then you still lose, because you know what? Jesus did exactly that when he said that the Father is greater than him. You did exactly that once you limited Jesus into a man from his God nature. This would mean that the Islamic view of God wins, since he doesn't die, or need sustenance, or lack knowledge. So, thanks David. Maybe we can be friends. I can easily think of a being greater than the God of the Quran. In fact, in at least one way, I'm greater than the God of the Quran. I love unbelievers. Allah doesn't. <laughs> You serious? You twisted your mind until now. You really think that your love is greater simply because you love a larger quantity of people, even if they might be the wrong people. You are reading the world with your New Testament glasses on. That's the only reason why you see this as a good thing. Let's apply this logic to any of God's other attributes. God eventually tortures the bad people for eternity, not the good people. I'm going to go torture everyone, even the good guys, so I can know that I do more torturing than God. You see how that works? The Islamic and even the biblical idea of God's love is about quality, not quantity. Allah loves more than anyone, but that doesn't mean that he loves everyone. He doesn't have to in order to satisfy this attribute. He punishes greater than anyone, but that doesn't mean he punishes everyone. He can do whatever he wants with his attributes because they're his. He's not a slave to his sense of justice that makes him punish people he loves. He rightfully hates and punishes who he pleases. David, etch this into every fiber of your soul. Nobody cares about your view of God. You cannot measure other people's view of God by your man-made standards. The amount of love Allah has for the believers is greater than any love you want to superimpose on the God of the Bible. Him not loving people who don't deserve it only magnifies his wisdom. Paul's view of God loving everyone only magnifies the emptiness of Christianity. Assuming that's what he supports anyway. Allah's love for those who earn it is greater than any love you can imagine. He doesn't need to love bad people to prove that. And by the way, stop lying to us, David. We all know you don't love unbelievers. You're just saying that because the New Testament tells you to. If you loved unbelievers, you would love Hitler, Genghis Khan, George Bush, and Satan. I can do you one better. You would love the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Don't even try to lie to yourself or anyone else and tell me you do. Your entire channel is an anti-Islamic pit stop aimed almost entirely at degrading the Prophet Muhammad. You do it more than you teach Christianity. You mock and lie about him like the Nazis did to the Jews. You don't love unbelievers. If you insist that you do, then why do you talk about him in such a way? Is this how you treat people you love? If so, then your view of love is meaningless. It's nothing more than a subjective feeling that can be defined in any way you decide and can manifest itself into any behavior you want it to. 
I cannot believe we went from the logic of God dying to the rabbit hole of emptiness known as New Testament love. Assalamu alaikum. You may have every title, every big shot degree, but you still can't explain how can God die? Oh yeah, Mama Dama Bark, everybody. Assalamu alaikum.